Hello, good evening, and welcome to this, the next Two Fat Lardies podcast. I hope you've all enjoyed the recent royal excitement in the United Kingdom, and it perhaps comes as no surprise to know that I am joined today by the Charles and Camilla of the historical miniature wargaming hobby. Can I welcome my good friends, Richard Clark and Nick Skinner to the Oddcast. Guys, have you enjoyed the festivities? Oh, yes, Sid, very much. Enjoyed my Union Cup, my Union Jack cupcakes. Of course, my middle name is Charles, so uh, I'll take that one, Sid. And, and actually, my, my middle name is Camilla. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought that? <laughs> Shock, <laughs> horror. It's a remarkable coincidence. <clears throat> Stop press. <laughs> this is more exciting than anything else we'll be talking about. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Although we do have quite a lot to talk about because we have been, well, you both and me, but all of us, but especially you two, you've been doing a lot and a lot has been happening to you guys. That's it. <laughs> you've been doing a lot and a lot has been <laughs> doing you. <laughs> no wonder I'm so naked. <laughs> so we probably want to start off the journey with the recent Salute show, which... Oh. God, so Good. much has happened. I've forgotten about Salute. What about the biggest war game show in Britain? Well, you yeah. were me attended, Rich. Uh, you were in Vienna, Nick. Um, I was, yeah. And uh, I, yeah, shout out for Vienna is a fantastic destination for the uh, for the history tourist, mate, including Archduke Franz Ferdinand's car, the one in which he was assassinated in 1914. Very interesting to see, complete with bullet hole. Is that available from Avis? Probably when you get yeah. to the airport. <laughs> oh, Vienna is lovely. Austria is very clean, very beautiful. The beer is fantastic, and the food is sensational. Yeah, I it's it's a country that I've been meaning to go to. We had some great friends up in the Lake District who in the in the UK who ran a pub, and she was Austrian. And the food that she used to cook was superb. I mean, we used to do a lot of uh, fairly heavy duty fell and hill walking and when you came down in the evening you knew you were going to get something for din dinner that stuck to your ribs and i've always intended to go always intended to go never quite got around to it so it's on my bucket list so i was very jealous well maybe we can you know sit there's a battlefield tour in the making maybe we could do a battlefield challenge out there there's plenty to see out by the danube mm. there's a lot well done out. yep yeah there's a huge amount huge amount um i've actually thought of doing that tour myself so maybe one of these days the two of you and me could head up over there in a car because i think you know whether you're following the duke of marlborough or napoleon or anything in between and later you know there's a lot to see around there yeah but it wasn't so it meant i wasn't at salute you're right well, that was what you started with sid if you remember all those <laughs> when the conversation started i wasn't at salute i missed salute I really you know what? When I booked to go to Vienna, I wasn't that bothered about the fact that it was going to clash with Salute. I thought, actually, you know, I miss Salute, but, you know, so what? I miss it. We do all the shows. Missing one won't hurt. And then when it came down to it and what I saw what was going on from afar, I felt really that I was missing out on an absolute blinder. You did, actually. And, and I'm, I'm fairly well known for saying I dislike war game shows. I much prefer going to the Lardy Games days than a war game show. War, only on the basis that war game shows are really hard work. You, you, I tend to be running games. I tend to have to be shouting at the top of my voice. Mm. I'm stood up all day on hard concrete floors, and by the end of it, I'm completely and utterly knackered. And mm -hmm. it, it's, it is hard yards. It really is hard work. Whereas um, a lot of games day is a lot more relaxed. But I, I was absolutely buzzing. There's a there's an interview with me done by Dan from War Games Illustrated, and I look like I'm on cocaine. I'm bouncing off the bloody walls, and that was that was at the end of the show, and it was fabulous. The Lard Zone was a great, great introduction. We had six games, six Lardy games, and a seventh as an annex with James uh, James Morris and Midgard just across the way. So we had lots going on, lots of people playing those games. Two of Two of those games won trophies, so full marks to Joe Bilton for his fabulous big chain of command game uh, around Dead Man's Corner in Normandy, which was absolutely amazing. Half the table was, uh, you know, urban. The other half was Normandy, Bocage, beautiful countryside. It looked fabulous. 
And then uh, Mark Backhouse won a, an award for his Strength and Honour game. He did the Battle of Cannae. And I have to say that the scenery was stunning. It's a, it's a game played in, with two mil scale figures, but it was still a huge table. It was something like eight by eight by four or uh, 10 by six. I, I can't quite remember, but it was a big, big table. And he and his chums had done an absolutely amazing job at presenting this beautiful hand-built terrain that really looked like an eagle's eye view of the battlefield. And Can I is, of course, one of the greatest battles in history. I mean, it really is uh, um, uh, right up there in terms of famous battles of the world, pro pro quite possibly the most famous battle of the world. Um, so it was, it was amazing to see. I want to give a shout out also, Sid, please, to Don Avis, who oh. ran uh, the Market Garden Arnhem Who's to Beat game for me at Salute. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Don is still custodian of all the goodies and all the stuff that, that make up that table, which I must get back from you at some point. But, yeah, thank you very much, Don. I know you worked really hard on that game all day uh, to entertain and uh, provide a bit of fun for people. So thank you very much for the, doing that from me. Yeah. And we had a great night out in the evening. I have to say, we had a great night out. We had quite, lots of people travelling. I mean, John uh, John Savage running What a Cowboy there had come down from Yorkshire, and <clears throat> Phil and Jenny running IP Shop Mum had come across from the West Country. And uh, quite a few of us, Joe Bilton, hadn't travelled quite as far from leafy Watford. But nevertheless, <laughs> we all assembled uh, in the area of Lard, the vicinity of Lard Island, had a few bevies in a, in a local pub and then went out for a, a lovely ruby. We had a great Indian meal and it was just super fun. We just had a super fun time. It was uh, really nice at the end of a day where you've worked hard to then play hard. And uh, I loved it. it. It was everything about it was classic Lard, good, good dates gaming, good evening socialising. Loved it. It was great. Brilliant show. It was really good, wasn't it? And I think all of those things I, I'd absolutely echo. I think one of the nicest things after the sh difficult, you know, sort of challenging show, and people have been very busy is always catching up after the show. Mm. And we did that in the Curry House really well. But I think one of the things that we probably haven't mentioned so much is just how successful the buzz was about what a cowboy. Oh, Liney. Well, actually, you, you raise a really good point there because I was just about to ask you what the hell happened at Salute in terms of other <laughs> things happening because I literally saw nothing. I was nailed to the trade stand all day. My plan originally was that Emma was going to run the trade stand, that I was going to be able to circulate around the games and talk to people. It just didn't happen. We were literally... Um, uh, overcome almost by a torrent of people all day from the moment the show opened. And bear in mind that we were right at the back by the bins. So it, it, normally it takes nearly an hour for people to percolate through the different filtering layers of games and trade stands. But no, there was this huge rush, like a stampede, the heading <laughs> for the trade stand and people were going, what a cowboy, what a cowboy, what a cowboy, all day. And then I discovered they were talking about Sid. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it, it, um, it's got, what a cowboy has done amazingly well, and people are playing it and loving it, and and uh, posting their stories online. And I just had to order a restock and uh, the second print run. And uh, bear in mind, it's only been out for two weeks. I mean, that's that's some going. Yeah, thousands of copies gone out the door. Well, I think one of the things that we didn't notice absolutely. I think everyone noticed at Salou was just how busy the large zone was. I mean, it really was besieged. I mean, a lot of other places in Salou were also besieged. I've got to say, yeah. there was a lot of room to move around there because the venue is huge. But at oh, the awesome. same time, um, every single stall I tried to get to was busy, and just about every game was busy. I mean, I think the large zone more than most. Um, got to be impartial about that, but I still think large zone more than most and it was certainly very difficult to get a place at some of those games and i think you know, people were very patiently waiting and that was great to see um, it was a good show i think it was a uh, it, was, it was well attended it seemed very busy um i think everyone i spoke to had a really good time there was a lot to do there you know there's a lot of companies to see companies doing demo games um but you know also some fantastic display and also participation games and very strong participation games this year 
And I got the chance to talk to some of the designers about those. And I really enjoyed doing that. So yeah, really good day. But um, so well done, Rich. That was that was good work on the day. A lot of traders who I spoke to after the event, because obviously we 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 know each other, we talk, you know. I um, they all said best salute ever or second best you know they all said it was really really colossally good days trading but what they also said and i thought this was relevant is that's it we're back from covid uh you know in previous the previous couple of years where we've gone back there's there's been a feeling that people are a little bit worried a little bit concerned maybe not turning up maybe only turning up for half a day but they all said look this is that's it we're back we're really back, and uh, it was it was a great show. So I think it was successful for many many people for many different reasons. Um, but yeah, we, for for us, uh, the the new format with the large zone was really successful uh, in terms of making it a fun event. And as you say, loads of people playing games, loads of people laughing and enjoying themselves. And that's that's the that's the the litmus test. It's definitely the litmus test, isn't it? I think that's right. And that's really at the heart of all wargaming, but certainly all Two Fat Lardies related wargaming. But moving from laughing to perhaps holding your sides in with a slight amount of discomfort, because I know one of the elephants in the room, Richard, is is possibly the size of different bits and pieces of scatter coming out of you physically. And we know <laughs> that uh, you've been in hospital for a small amount of time, but you're looking very very well at the minute do you want to just reassure people that there's no more 28 mil scatter to be removed from the inside of your gallbladder yeah well the lobotomy went well um <laughs> so but yeah i had my gallbladder whipped out um which means that and actually that happened on the monday after salute so i literally <laughs> got got back on uh on the sunday morning after the curry and had to shift all the stock, go up to the um, storage unit and get everything done because I knew I wouldn't be able to lift anything for another month. So that Sunday was a bit frantic trying to get ready. But, yeah, they, they um, whipped out my gallbladder. By by Monday evening, I had four more holes in me than God had ever intended. Um, and uh, so and that's, take, that's taken a lot of getting over. I honestly thought... Oh, they'll knock me out. They'll whip the bits out. That evening, I'll be sat there with my laptop working away. I was absolutely off with the fairies for about four days because of the general anaesthetic. And um, I also have only just now, and it's two weeks ago today, the operation happened. Only in the last couple of days have I been able to sit at my desk. It, it, uh, and, and I couldn't have a laptop on my stomach because that's where all the wounds were. <laughs> So I, it has rather um, knocked me back in terms of schedule. I was intending to have the Far East handbook out in time for um, for partisan, but I literally, I, I haven't been able to work on it. I literally haven't been able to uh, sit and work at my desk, um, which is frustrating. And also I thought, oh, I'm going to get a load of reading done. But I was completely off with the fairies. I mean, I was absolutely, I was trying to read. I couldn't read more than half a page. My Whatever the drunks they used, my brain was completely addled on them. Now, I know you may say that's not unusual, but there we are. It's, uh, um, but in yeah, but personally, I feel mm. great and um, and I'm looking good, mate. I think that's uh, looking good, feeling great. That's my motto. Good. So you've now got a void inside you, Rich. Is that is that true to say? There's a void that you're going to have to fill somehow with something. Does your what does your beer belly expand to fill the gap or something? How does that Maybe work? I don't know. Actually, I, I, I'm not really sure how it works medically, but I think they cut holes in you and they put a mechanical spider in through the biggest hole, and it yeah. goes <laughs> across your body and eats your gallbladder, and then they have to entice it out with chocolates or something, right. and then it comes good. out. And um, and then they sew you up. So medically, I think that's about right. So it's this big spider at my gallbladder, uh, <laughs> which I no longer have. So I don't know what replaces it. Maybe, maybe, um, maybe yeah. that's like, maybe I'm like the Tin Man. Maybe they put a heart in there or something like that. Or that was that the lion? That was a lion, wasn't? It? I'm sure there was a mechanical spider like that in one of the Alien movie franchises, but that might be where I got the idea. Sounds like the say. Is still to wear off to me. 
putting a xenomorph inside your stomach didn't end well for John Hurt, but we'll no, move on. That might be why I've got four extra holes, but they're, they're not quite <laughs> cured, actually. And they, But I am at the point where I'm doing things normally, and then all of a sudden I'll go, ah, bloody hell! Um, but... There we go. At least I'm at least I'm here, mate. That's the main thing. I'm not dead. <laughs> that is good. We I do confirm. actually feel really good because I've been feeling ill for over a year. So it's it's nice to feel good. And I've rediscovered my drinking head. Oh dear. <laughs> Publicans rejoice throughout <laughs> the land. Yeah, it's been good. Uh, it's good to see you back and doing a bit of hobby as well, because I know. It's about that time to look at what all of us have been doing with our trip to the workshop. So here we are in the workshop, and he's actually looking more tidy, which I think is probably because you've not been doing a huge amount of stuff. Uh, clearly, Freddie must have been tidying things up in your absence. I'm not quite sure. But we do have... Something which looks pretty splendid and uh, got to say ridiculously huge, but it could only be a huge submarine. But you're going to tell us, Nick, what sort of submarine it is and why on earth you're building a submarine which looks about as long as an arm. Yeah, well, it's it's 38 inches of submarine to you, mate, uh, which is about 14 inches bigger than I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> but really, if I thought about it, it's actually about the right size. It's a... It's a, a it's for my dockyard, Sid. I'm building a dockyard for a game that I'm putting on for Operation Market Larden in June, uh, which is a commando raid on Saint Lardair. You'll notice what I've done there. Um, and uh, somehow that was clever. A, it was very clever. <laughs> <laughs> um, and somehow on a four by six or seven by five table, I've got to recreate something uh, something that's sort of fairly similar to. Um, the, uh, the the raid on Saint Nazaire when the Campbell Town I think in scale must be about eight feet long. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and it so, sounds the most stupid game ever. Well, certainly the Nor if you think the Normandy dock at Saint Nazaire was big enough to take the turpits, then <laughs> then uh, then you can imagine you can imagine um, how different this game will need to be. But it will take a commando dockyard raid game uh, to Saint to um, to. OML at Evesham, which should be really good. And I think the places are booked up for that. So, yeah, I've got a submarine, uh, which I've got to try and fit on the table now, as I said, knowing that it's a lot bigger than I thought it was. But it's come up. It's a really clear and crisp, obviously, 3D print in about five parts. I've got some uh, I've ordered some Empress Miniatures U-boat crew to uh, be in the conning tower if need if needs be. Um, and I've also got some um, what are they called? Kriegsmarine on order although i'm really fr i ordered some kriegsmarine and uh you know put them in the basket and i uh, got the confirmation and then two minutes later confirmation telling me that my order was out of stock and it we'd they'd follow on as soon as it could how oh, annoying man. is that i mean that is uh, um yeah and i won't tell you who it was from um but um it was i hope that they're able to get the restock in as quick as they can but that wasn't <laughs> empress no, that wasn't Empress. No, no, that's good. Empress, Are you going to get one of those sirens that goes? Yeah, re whoop, whoop, whoop. Resellers. Um, no. Well, funny enough, uh, a whoop, whoop, whoop siren. Yeah, yeah. They have those on submarines then. Well, I don't know, but it would be great to set that off about every 10 minutes to annoy all the other guys. <laughs> that would be quite fun. Yeah, um, whoop, whoop, whoop. <laughs> so, so, it's, uh, so the submarine the submarine joins a growing um, assortment of goodies I've got uh, for the dockyard. I've got a lighthouse. Which is also about three foot tall. Um, this is all from a man who's got no space at all to keep any of this stuff. Of <laughs> I've just designed, I've just built and put together an administration block, which itself is uh, what's what's forty centimeters in 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 proper language. I don't know, Rich. How big is that? Inches. Inches, isn't it? Yeah. Well, so the base I cut for it was seventeen inches. So seventeen inches by seven inches for the admin block that's uh looks really good i'm gonna put a couple of flat guns on the top of that i've nice. got a railway line i've got some cranes dockyard cranes to go in there it's gonna look fantastic but uh, whether i'm getting it all on the table i've got no idea i've got to set it up in a, in a week or so and just see what it looks like what happens if it's too big for the room uh well <laughs> we'll just have to get a bigger room i'll get onto aid and say that we need a bigger table a bigger game but uh can we the, other... the whole, whole of the hotel can we turn um, the whole of the Norfolk hotel? 
Yeah, I've got to have a bit of sea space. Well, I've got to have a bit of sea room to get the uh, to get the motor torpedo boats in as well. So someone well, just fit, bring but... some buckets of seawater to create <laughs> the <experience. laughs> Now, Westers. Yeah, I'll be wearing my um, <laughs> Captain Bird's Eye jumper. I think. <laughs> but but it should be really good fun. I'm, I'm looking forward to because the commandos are slightly different because they're they're organised in slightly different teams. They've got teams of five. Uh, you know, some charged with demolition duties, some charged with um, fire support duties, uh, and that's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out as well. So it should be a really good fun game. I know that some guys down already to play it. They put their names down without knowing what it is. I just hope that it uh, they go away with a smiling face at the end of the day. But it's hopefully going to look really good and should play really nicely too. Because because actually, um, we've been thinking about how we would use, uh, you know, we talk about something called Go Commando, which might or yeah. might not emerge. But you know, actually, Chain of Command itself, uh, without really any need for any dramatic uh, changes, is pretty good at doing small team commando actions anyway. So we'll just see how that plays out. Yeah, I'm I'm very keen with Go Commando to 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 yeah. do. You know, much smaller, much smaller actions, maybe section size actions on a small table. But so uh, that's that's for another day. Yeah, so it's, yeah, that's that's going to be great, and this will be an interesting uh, kind of go between, I think, because this is this is probably pl platoon size in terms of figures involved, I would guess. Oh well, that's uh, that's called cool chain of command, mate. Then yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that all sounds great. I can't wait to see that. Um... It's going to be very different to the game I'm taking to OML, which is again eighteen inches square, which just about fits into your administration block. Yeah, good. I'll have to shave a bit really off my board. <laughs> shave a bit off my board, and the whole thing can fit into the administration block. And it yeah. can be like one of those MC Escher pictures that there's a game inside a game inside oh, a game. Wow, you blow my mind, mate. That's that's what we do here on the Oddcast. But less of this tomfoolery because a, a, a more manageable, serious project is underway with you, Richard, I know. And can I just say that it looks like we're going down under to a very unusual, um, different and exciting prospect, which you're doing with What a Cowboy. Yeah, what a cobber, mate. What a cobber. And, uh, I've, and the reason it looks a lot tidier in here is because um, whilst I couldn't sit down at my desk, I could stand up. <laughs> after the operation and so i've shifted a load of stuff into my office where i've been able to stand up uh because the war games table in there has got a, a map table lid and i've been able to stand up at that and do stuff that's on a fairly high level so i've been bu building some mdf buildings for colonial uh architecture down there now I've, i bought a couple of buildings from a company called tt combat which are really, really beautiful. Do you ever see the Sullivans or anything like that? There's yeah. a house here that looks exactly like that. It's brilliant. But it's huge. I mean, it's absolutely, um, I don't know, what is that? It's about 10 inches by uh, 7 inches. So it's, I thought it was going to be a small sort of squatter's residence, but actually it's going to be something a lot bigger. So I think this one is probably going to be a local store or maybe a hotel or something like that. Um, and the other one I've got is going to be uh, a large country residence. So I've just been cutting some boards out for those so that you can have a uh, sort of vegetable garden, country garden around it and uh, lawns to the front. But I bought some other buildings in MDF from Sarissa, which are in their Wild West range. And they're sort of log, a wooden cabin type things. Quite small, uh, about well, the cabin itself must be about four inches by three inches but it's got a veranda on the front. Now, one of the things you see a lot with colonial Australian architecture is they have a veranda all the way around or a, a large part of the way around the buildings. And in fact, we used to have them in Africa like that as well. So it's obviously hot countries. You put the veranda out to stop the sun going directly into the building so it keeps the property as cool as possible. So um, this, um, what I'm doing with these is taking the small sort of log cabin thing and expanding it out so whereas you've got a veranda on the front the veranda is going to be going three parts of the way around and also got um also got a, a railway halt from war bases which is a lovely little small railway halt um which i'm putting on a board with some stock pens and a few other bits and pieces there um i got uh, a sort of railway porter's um trolley which i've got some um uh sort of 
baggage on and bits and pieces like that, but really to try and decorate the board. I was really inspired by Jasper of, from WSS magazine who posted some pictures of a building that he'd done from Sarissa, one of their eastern front buildings, where he'd put it on a base and he'd used some of that wallpaper, Nick, that we used when we did the big game at Arnhem to give that sort of cobbled foot, yeah. uh, footpath look. Absolutely done an amazing job on it. And it just reinforced me how, by basing up a piece of terrain, you can turn it into something much more than it would have been. The only frustrating thing for me is I come to I came to do each each of these things. So the, the, the two farmhouses, the big one and the small one, are going to have a picket fence around a vegetable garden, outside dunny and things like that. Um, and I realised I've, I've run out of picket fencing. I haven't run out of it. I've based it all up and, and all the stuff that I'd had hanging around in the workshop for years. During lockdown, I based it all up. And so it's perfectly great for use on the table, but it's no good for converting to suit these particular buildings. So I've just had to put an emergency order out for all sorts of fencing. And I've gone to um, war bases and I've gone to Sarissa and I've gone to Charlie Foxtrot. So a big variety of fencing styles are going to be on display. But yeah, it's a really exciting project. I'm really keen to take Water Cowboy and extend it into a slightly different genre of Australian bushwhackers. Well, hold that thought for just a moment, because it's possible that we might be returning to that sort of project a little bit later in the Oddcast. Struth. Struth, indeed. Um, but I think now it's time to return to the studio and sit for a few moments on the couch of contemplation after the sofa of sincerity. Sydney Roundwood Sofa of Sincerity. So here we are, we're back. Uh, welcome everyone to the Sofa of Sincerity, where all three of us are sitting with our brand spanking new copies of the very lush and beautifully designed and very well illustrated by Jim Ibbotson copy of What a Cowboy. So Rich, now's the time for you to tell us about how you feel the first couple of weeks has been and uh, what's the feedback been like from the people who've bought the rules? Well, I think that's it, isn't it? That's proof of the pudding is in the eating, and that's definitely the case with any set of War Games rules. You know, you can you often see War Games rules reviewed by people who've not played them. And sometimes um, you think, oh, that's a risky thing to do. But um, one of the great things that we've had is we've had a load of people putting figures on the table and playing the games. And I think what's great is you don't it's a very low barrier to entry you don't need a lot of figures to play what a cowboy you don't need a lot of terrain and i think the truth of the matter is most of us have got some cowboys hanging around somewhere or other uh, that we can use so um that i think a lot of people were ready to go on the starting line and as soon as the pistol went off they were able to chuck some stuff on the table and get playing and and the response has been absolutely amazing uh, i know john is is been over the moon uh and um, is busy responding to questions that the type you're always going to get. Um, but uh, one of the things that's been brilliant for him is to see so many people so enthused by what he's produced and uh, really enjoying the games. You know, we've had some fabulous feedback on um, the Facebook group, What a Cowboy Facebook group. And if you fancy playing What a Cowboy, why not join us? Because there's some great reports on there. And okay. I keep saying, hey, guys, go and put these reports on other fora around the internet because people are saying to me, I'm really interested in What a Cowboy, but I can't see any game reports. Well, that's because they're all on the Facebook group. Which There's um, a lot There is a lot going on on Twitter. It's been great to see so many people painting up and, and playing their games. And, you know, some of the character names are just ridiculously absurd. I guess that's part of the fun, isn't it? That's part of the fun, isn't it? I mean, I painted I painted the Lone Ranger yesterday. Mm. He's a bit of a loan shark in Lardville, and uh, he's, he's a masked stranger. Great fun. Um, I, in fact, you know, we, we keep saying this is a game where you only need half a dozen figures to play, but I must, he, I must have painted a couple of dozen figures in the last couple of weeks, and that's often only been able to stand for five minutes at a time and paint so it's um it's been great and part of that 
has been painting some 3D printed figures, um, which is a first for me. Um, and a friend of mine printed me some out. And it was, it's been a really interesting experience. I'll tell you what I found. When they're done and dusted and all painted and based and you put them on the table, they're the same as any other figure. They're neither better nor worse than metal. Um, uh, the quality of the figure will be determined by the way it's sculpted and then the way it's printed. So if you've got a crap printer, you'll get a crap figure. If you've got a brilliant printer, you'll get a brilliant figure, um, hopefully. Um, but um, I certainly found that painting them, once they were undercoated, um, painting them was just the same as painting anything else in 28 mil. But the only thing I will say, and this is about computer aided design, where you design things on a computer instead of sculpting it, is that the amount of detail that's on some of the figures is so extreme that it must look fabulous when you've got it on a on a huge computer screen where you, where you're zooming in and designing that figure. But when you print it out. I can't necessarily see all of that detail. So sometimes it did feel um, a little bit of the detail on there was incredible, but beyond any aspirations I could have as a painter. Now, I know there are some painters out there who can do a brilliant job with it. So that's the only thing that I thought that I would say that I didn't think was a negative, but I thought it was interesting to see it was the level of detail is so good that it's beyond my painting skills, but it doesn't matter because when you put it on the table, you can't see that level of detail anyway. It's just a you know a figure on the table. So really enjoyed painting him, and uh, um, a friend of friend of the show, Mike up in uh, in Leicester, is sending me some Red Indians, Native Americans, call them what you will. So and the stuff he's done there look absolutely brilliant, and I've seen quite a few games with people playing Native American Indians against. Um, uh, Seventh Cavalry. Uh, yeah. Who doesn't love a bit of that? Nick, you could get your John Wayne silly hat on and, um, and yeah, wear absolutely. a yellow ribbon. Yeah, I really fancy a bit of that as well. It's interesting what you say about the painting, Rich, and the detail. Uh, the, mm. What came into my mind when you said that was a, a um, something that Gary Chalk, you know, Gary Chalk is a uh, yeah, yeah. He said, you should uh, come to the club years he ago. Come to stuff, remember, many years ago. And he said, paint what you can see, what not what you know is there. And that kind, of, kind of sticks in my head, actually, kind of, because what he's saying is about don't get down into the detail. You just need to sh paint mm. what you can see. And that, you know, if you try to overpaint the detail, it just looks crap. Yes, that's exactly my experience. So what, wise words from the uh, true Normand that is Gary now. Indeed. I think that's a really good point on 3D prints. I mean, I've got something for uh, the game at OML, which is which Paul Edwards printed for me. It's quite quite large considering the table size and I've made little replicas which could either be given out as little trophies in the game or they uh, they serve as small uh, objectives let's say without giving too much away and it's the same print which is beautifully detailed at the reasonable mm. size um, it, you know it's over it's over 60 millimeters 70 millimeters but shrunk down, you can't see the detail, but it's there. And I think that the temptation is because the detail's there. Yeah. You want to paint it. And I think that's always, you know, it's always been a slight concern I've had with some of the six mil figures that, you know, it becomes so good that you feel inclined to paint it. But as Gary would say, there's really no point because you just can't see it. You're looking for the overall impression. It's a bit like when you go to an art gallery and you see, you know, a fantastic painting. If it's painted in a, totally realistic fashion that's not necessarily better than an impressive than an impressionist masterpiece it's the reaction that you have to the figures when you see them on the table it's not exactly how you paint them in in infinite amount of detail well i've been very impressed by what i've seen on the internet what other people have done and some of the setups that people have created uh the range of mdf buildings that supports cowboy games range of 3d printings that support cowboy games um, you know, you don't need a huge amount. I'm going to need some help actually later on, guys, to do a campaign map that I'm working on, uh, so that I know what I need to get in terms of terrain for for that. But you know, it's the, it's uh, it's easy, isn't it? It's it's a, it's a. I think one of the things that's made what Cowboy so successful is that you it's a it's a you can do it as well as everything else, can't you? You can play it alongside your main period. It's good. It's a bit of fun. It is, uh, and I'll tell you what I'm really excited about. I don't know if you remember, there was a company called Snapdragon Studios who. Yeah disappeared off the off the scene and the guy who who ran it who built these beautiful buildings 
decided, um, apparently, so I've been told, decided that that was it. He was just going to shut up shop. He wasn't going to sell the buildings. He was going to just, that was it. And it was a shame because I've got some fabulous uh, Wild West resin buildings from him, but he had a whole range of sort of down Mexico way, south of the border buildings that look really, really good. A Deacon uh, yeah. tweeted some pictures of the ones in his uh, collection, and we've got a good friend, uh, Harpers, who's got a load, um, which which he had, which are which, uh, really nice. And what I've decided to do is I'm going to replicate those i've got paul working on printing me out some door frames some windows some window um lintels and um whatever and i'm going to take those images and i'm going to build them uh and replicate them in the snapdragon style using um foam board uh, which i then plaster over and then adding the details with 3D printed doors and things like that. So that's something I'm really looking forward to doing for a down south of the border game and putting on Lab TV as well, because they were beautiful buildings. I think that's the best of both worlds, isn't it? I've got to say that I think that's the best of both worlds. When you're able to scratch build yourself for the yeah. table size that you want and you're comfortable with. So that's the idea of the small footprinted buildings or the big footprinted buildings. It doesn't really matter. It's you're building for yourself, but you're able to dip into a range of things which are produced exactly as you want them. I think yeah. that's where 3D printing really comes into its own. That's personally speaking, other views might differ, but I think that's the best of all different worlds when you're using the 3D to really augment what you're already doing. I was talking to a good mate of the show down in uh, down in Australia, Frank Frank Sultana, who's tweeted uh, some pictures, or I think it might tweeted it might any social media of a french garage that he built absolutely scratch built this garage fabulous but when we say scratch built it he printed 3d printed so much of the details you know the big doors the big doors the small doors and the middle doors and uh, all the all the signage the lighting all the um garage paraphernalia that you get i don't know welding equipment or old tires and things like that and it really and alan did this when we were building to go to arman he could create the box using i don't know wood or whatever you use but then he could put the details on using yeah. 3d prints it's yeah. it's a fabulous tool for building building and things like that so i'm really looking forward to to doing that and i think nick i'm going to build you a 38 foot hacienda because clearly you like doing things on a grand scale <laughs> but well yeah. I, was like, yeah, I, was, I think sarissa do rather nice cattle barons um house don't they no, no. House, which looks splendid because of yeah. course we've got a cowboy you can go you know you can take the action inside the buildings as well if you want to if yeah. you wanted to put tables and a bar in your saloon you could do that and uh a lot of the models now are really fantastic for the detail. They've got interior details as much as anything else, and that's part of the fun as well. And and what I mean, John, I think we're still talking about what cowboy massive hands, uh, hands up, hands up, shout out, well done, thank you very much to John Savage for for delivering his baby over all that time because it's been really good fun. I've built up a, um, I've, I've finally been able to get Diego Fuego and the Underlay Gang, for instance. Ah, uh, uh, did you roll them up? Did you roll yeah, them? Up? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you want to know about them? Yes, I'd love yeah. to. I've been watching Diego for over. Some fabulous Mexican figures. Who? What sculpts are they? Because they're, they're, so they're well, they're funny enough. They're black scorpion of all things, and they and they're cast in a kind of really horrible resin, actually. Uh, which, <laughs> which, which, <laughs> not not neither three D nor metal. So they're kind of something else in between. You have to right. you have to wash it quite carefully first before it paints the before it holds the paint. In my experience with that particular group of figures i've had other black scorpion ones that taken paint fine these ones are a bit more tricky but anyway yeah we've got diego fuego and the underlay gang so diego fuego is el hombre con lumbago just because he can have um i'm not quite sure how lumbago affects him being a gunfighter but he's a, <laughs> he's a shootist in fact he's a former soldier rich who's now a shootist oh and the armies of maximilian and he's a brawler as well, so oh. that gives him certain advantages, which we we'll, can't wait to see what they bring him. <laughs> then he's flanked by the Underlay Brothers, um, the best carpet layers east of the Pecos, um, Neville Underlay and Desmondo Underlay. They are both shootists as well. Um, Neville Underlay, Underlay. 
<laughs> underlay, underlay, that's it. <laughs> no apologies made. Um, ne Neville underlay is a formerly was a beaver trapper, so he must have used beavers to make carpets out of beaver belts um, that you could have in your hacienda. Um, so he's a beaver trapper, and Desmondo obviously here's the connection with Diego because he's also a former soldier. Now, interestingly, mm. both the underlay brothers who are slightly rotund. Uh, mm. in their appearance at least um desmondo was born in the saddle as well which is probably the last time he fitted in it <laughs> <laughs> superb so and then we've got they're supported by um the three greenhorns so we've got mexican bob who's a vaquero uh he's a bit jumpy and old mm. mexican bob gotta be careful and uh, then we've got two pedros pedro pecos who's also a vaquero and he's tough and there's pedro porco now, Pedro Porco, he's a miner. I don't know what he's been mining for, um, but he obviously didn't come up with much luck. And he must have spent a lot of his time doing it because he's got no other skills at all. So if you're <laughs> a, if you're a hole to be dug, Pedro, Peco, Pedro Porco um, is the man for it. So that's the uh, that's Diego Fuego and the underlay gang for you, mate. They'll be ah. on a table near you very soon, maybe running up with uh, Ron Seal or Little Jim. We'll have to wait and see. Well, I can see, um, yeah, I can see Little Jim being forced to go south of the border because he's so bleeding ugly. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, but he's going to have to move, is he? He's going to have to move. He's going to need some carpets made to have, you know, different different headgear, I think. <laughs> A carpet-based headgear. Hence, he'll uh, probably run into trouble with the underlay gang, I would have thought, if he starts right. to buy carpets from anybody else. OK, so have you rolled up your your campaign territory? No, no that's what, no, I need, to, I need still need to do that. I haven't rolled up the campaign territory. Uh, fancy doing it now, see what you get, because I'm quite uh... keen to see what's out the border. <laughs> Yeah, OK, all right. You're going to have a town at the centre. What's it, what, do you know what it's going to be called? Because that's oh, the no, I'm not, I'm you can that choose that. Answers on a postcard, maybe. I don't know what the Yeah, answers are. Yeah, we need a competition here, Sid. Yeah, Perhaps you can do a competition to see what we should call Nick's Mexican town. Right, you got 2d6 on you, mate. Um, yep. Right, OK. So um, let's roll 2d6 to see what outskirt districts that we get around the town of Lumbago. Okay, right, we've got a two and a four, a six. Six, right, well, you've got a livery yard. Right, okay. Right. So, so the Lumbago yeah. livery, livery yard, right, and two, okay. two, two more? Four and a six, a ten. Ten, and that's a graveyard. Well, that doesn't bode well for little Jim, does it? <laughs> <laughs> and the next one? Okay, uh, oh, a double two. Right, four. Oh, you got a railroad station, so the railroad has, has come to Lumbago. Oh, okay. Right. I'm going to go right at that railroad. Right, okay. And the last, the last of our outskirt districts. A four and a one. Four and a one is five. Yeah. That's a timber mill. Timber mill. So, <laughs> well, that's a range. Uh, you got quite a range there. So the town of Lumbago, obviously the, obviously the railroad has come to it because it's a major... Timber producing region of northern Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, it's a desert full of trees. Yeah. And you've got a graveyard because everybody who goes there dies of some hideous disease. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, let's have a look at the outlying territories. So give, give me 2d6. 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 The one again. Four. Four. How much are you? Five. Five. Oh, that's a railroad construction site. So the, the, the railroad is in Lumbago, but it doesn't go very far, right? <laughs> and then the next 2D6. A double five. Double five. It's Dry Gulch Canyon. Oh. So you've got to translate that into Spanish. I don't know what that'll be. So the railroad is obviously headed for Dry Gulch Canyon. 2D6. Hang on, write it down. All right. Okay, next one. Right, Four, quicker. Three, seven, seven. Seven. There's a mine. There's a mine. Well, this, this is all making sense, isn't it? Yeah, so you've got, you've got the canyon, you've got the mine, you've got the railroad heading to it. Uh, we've got a three and a one, a four. The right, prairie. that's the prairie. There's an area of open prairie. Okay. okay. How many have we got now? Is that four so far? I've got one more to go. One more one to more. go. It's yeah. a five and a four, a nine. Nine. That's that's a lazy S ranch. 
Oh, right, okay. Whoa. That's get my house in there. Hey, gringo. The gringos are heading south of the border, taking the land. So uh, what was the first one? The construction site, railroad construction. Railroad construction site, yeah. Right, okay. So right. we can see it. So intriguing. <laughs> We've got a timber town with a railroad <laughs> taking the wealth of, <laughs> of these rich trees. I think it's pretty realistic, to be honest. I mean, there's plenty, yes. of, plenty okay. of locations out in the western of USA which would be perfectly suited to that. Yeah, well, and I can see the fact who was Porco Poco or whatever his name was, who was the miner. Well, he obviously was working in the mine and has realised that there's 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 loot to be had. There's swag up there in this rich timber town, and yeah. he's taken he's taken the underlay gang up there. <laughs> Oh well, we, we can only we can only oh. hope that we can wait and see who they run up against. Maybe maybe um, maybe this time for little Jim to head south of the border and uh, see where see if he can make his fortune or well, regain yeah. his good looks. Well, if you know Ron Seal might yeah, tell him that he's got to move off. Yeah. Uh, well, I think Ron Seal has told him that in no uncertain terms. <laughs> Right, brilliant. Well, that was a bit yeah, of fun, mate. And also, it's um, I look at it from a, from a you know, game perspective as well. Actually, it's um, what we've got dry gold, dry gold. It's kind of terrain. Actually, I like it from a terrain perspective because I haven't got to get loads and loads of stuff either. Yeah, um, I agree. For, you know, what are the things I've got? But I think I do need to get quite fun. Yeah, I, I love the idea of doing a sort of uh, dry gulch canyon. You know, with those big bluffs and yeah, the path yeah. winding its way through the sort of chaparral. Uh, I, I, that could make a really great game with actually no terrain in terms of buildings on it at all. Just well, a load of tumbleweed and a few cacti. And well, uh, look, three rocks. of my three of my Mexicans have got long arms, so they'd be quite happy sitting up in the rocks and sniping away from there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice one, thank you, guys. I think and shouting underlay, underlay. That's it. <laughs> One of the things which I think is quite fun is the number of little plastic train sets which have been purchased by the people all through Twitter. Um, I've just bought my I've just bought my second wand in order to get the railway track. I was looking to buy some more straights of railway track, and I realised that the cheapest way to get more straights of railway track was to buy another bloody train set. And they're about twelve pounds or something. Yeah, this this one's about eleven quid. Yeah, mentioned to me, you know. Go through Twitter and you see about half a dozen people on any, on any given day painting up little kiddies plastic train sets. So, dear dear listeners, if you're one of those people who hasn't yet got a plastic train set from eBay, please don't hesitate because obviously Rich is he's more like a robber baron at the moment than just somebody who's making for himself. He's a JP Morgan of the plastic train set world. <laughs> also, dear listener, if you're the if you're the listener who produces that train, please don't think that the market is really doing as well as you think it is. Yeah. I was just looking to see who made it. I've got the box here, and I really have no idea. It doesn't actually say where it's produced, so uh, um, that probably tells us exactly where it's produced. But yeah, no, it's um, it, it's a it's a crazy looking train. That you can get on eBay, but once you paint them out, they're brilliant, absolutely amazing. Um, and at, at buying the second train set, some of it was duplicated, like the engine was the same, but it does mean I've now I can do a train with two passenger cars and right. it had a guards van, which the first one didn't have. So I could have engine, the tender with the coal in it, two passenger carriages, and a guards van at the end, or I've got two. Um, sort of cattle trucks, open uh, goods train, so I can do a goods train and I can do whatever. So it gives you quite a lot of variety having the two two train sets. Yeah, but you just see a game where the gang are trying to ride alongside the train. Exactly, exactly. You get the train moving and you get the gang and they've got to do the Hollywood stunt and leap onto the engine and all that. What a <laughs> well, game that is going to be. I don't know how your big fat born in the saddle bloke is going to manage it. You'll probably knock the train off the rails. Maybe <laughs> we'll find that out. It's got to happen, mate. It's got to happen. Then maybe we should have to, maybe we should do that on live TV. That would be fun. That would be fun, yeah. It would be, yeah. Right, okay. Yes, yeah, sorry, Sydney. We're we we're, we're getting too carried away. <laughs> no, carried away is absolutely great because I think. Why are we you telling us off then with hand signals? <laughs> I think one of the things 
that you've just demonstrated is how you can take just a normal set of rules and look through the rules and make the best use of things like the campaign aspects or the different scenarios using different pieces of terrain that you find around. Well, that probably nicely brings us on to our big issue for the podcast, which is looking at rule sets and adapting them to other periods. Now, I mentioned before that we would go back down under to Watacoba. So, Richard, spotlight on you. Talk us through how you've been using Water Cowboy to spread the wings, so to speak, to another really important um, area of expansion in the late 19th century, Australia and um, the Australian outback. Yeah, I just, um, uh, when I was down in Australia, I tried to spend as much time looking at historical stuff as possible. I mean, I had had a really interesting tour around the Victoria Barracks in uh, Paddington and uh, on the outskirts of Sydney. It was really interesting to see how the original colony developed um, with um, a Botany Bay and then Parramatta and how the two things were linked by the barracks. But I also, when I drove back from Canberra, I drove down to the coast uh, and spent an overnight there, just specifically so I could drive through some of the, the open countryside that was there wild west, if you like, in the uh, uh, mid-19th century. And I just thought, you know, the whole bush ranger thing, you know, we, we were... In this country, when we were kids, we were brought up on tales of Ned Kelly. Um, you know, you, you never ceased to hear about a bloke with a bucket on his head. And um, it was, um, I just thought this could be really, really fun to do. Um, and there's a, there's an old rebel song uh, called The Wild Colonial Boy. And uh, I've always loved that song. And uh, it's it's a bit of fun about a guy called... Well, his name varies and changes depending whether you're listening to the original Australian one or the one the one sung in the in the bars with people passing around a bucket to put your money in for the cause, or you're you're um, listening to Doctor Hook and his medicine band singing their version of it. So you got Jack Doolan, Jack Dugan, different versions of the name, but basically it's about a wild colonial boy, a terror to Australia. Um, who um, held people up and nicked their money and this, that and the others, and in the end was uh, gunned down by three troopers, um, uh, 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 Kelly Davis and Fitzroy in the song, uh, from the New South Wales Police. And I just, it was a lovely little story, and I thought I'd really like to do that. It would be good fun to do. And uh, it's, you know, you, you can go... Th- uh, go through the rules and use um, uh, and use the systems that are in there um, without an awful lot of changes. You know, you've, you've got those random events, for example. Um, so you, you've got hungry like a wolf in the main rules where, you know, you get a dog or a wolf or a bear or something attacks. And I thought you could just call that hello possums and you could, <laughs> you could have a typical Australian animal attack maybe, uh, Maybe, maybe it could be a platypus duck running amok, which we know happens because we've seen evidence of uh, platypus ducks running amok in some Australian cultural references. Um, But, yeah, I mean, all sorts of things in there that I just thought, you know, could be really fun. And, of course, you can take the Bonanza token and rename it a Bonza token, which... (laughs) Which doesn't take a lot, but yeah, I really like the idea of having sort of random events. I, I bought a, I got a three D printed drop bear. Now, <clears throat> if you if you're not aware, any Australian listeners will know that a drop bear is a koala gone bad. When yeah. koalas go bad, they don't just go bad; they really go bad. And the, a drop bear is a koala that will sit in a tree, and when you're walking by nonchalantly, it will drop out and land on you and savage you with its Terrible talons and sharp teeth. So drop bear attack could be in there, but it could be anything, you know. Maybe you hear that your cockatoo is overheated and it's time to keep your cockatoo cool or uh, something something along those lines. Or or Skippy turns up and and tells you you that somebody's trapped down a mine shaft. Now, that's all well and good. So do you – does one of your characters go with Skippy to assist somebody down a mine shaft or – Carried away. Or, or do you, or do you become? Do you have a reputation as a bad guy because everybody knows 
that you're the rotter who didn't help Skippy. There are so many different random events that you can use which reflect the period. You did try and frame this in a very historical way. By I saying, yeah, it's a like historical way. This is, <laughs> I, thought this we were, is a, I thought we were a historical war this game. Is podcast. No bollocks. Oh, this is an opportunity to have a laugh. It's a, it's a fun game. And if you can't keep your cockatoo cool, you well, what's the point in being there? Yeah, well, look, Sid, you hold him down and I'll go for the nurse. Right. <laughs> From one hospital well, think, to well, another. Well, Sid, no, I think let me try and let me try and 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 you know re restore the show to its um <laughs> its, its correct uh position on this. <clears throat> People love to take basic games and apply them to something else don't they look yeah. at how many versions of chain of command people now play I, I, I see chain of command taking place in all different places outside world war ii at the moment there's people have applied it into vietnam it's star gone wars. first world war we've got star wars games being played mm. um, I've, I've even got some i've even got some star trek figures that i'm thinking of doing some chain of command stuff with once you've got the basic model it's really easy to apply it to whatever you want to do and it's quite interesting with what a cowboy that people almost instantly were saying, oh, I'm going to take this and I'm going to apply it to this. You know, they, they, people are yeah. so so um, aware now, so able to take these things and transplant them somewhere else. And part of the thing, the, uh, the, the, you know, the skill is in, in the core product and its ability to be able to make that bridge. Rich, you want to say something? Yeah, obviously there are some, you know, being serious, I mean, apart from, you know, ha trying to represent Australian flora and fauna, um, there are some things, changes you need to make. So, for example... Mm -hmm. You know, your, your troopers are going to have the Snyder Enfield breech loading rifle. So it's a single shot breech loader. That's yeah. something quite different that you're not seeing in the Wild West because you're looking at uh, magazine loaded Winchesters and things like that. So you've got to add a, a few bits and pieces. But that's no huge leap, is it? No, no. I, I, I absolutely agree. I think that's one of the ways that you create real flexibility. Now, I do have a question for you both, which is a bit of a conundrum. <clears throat> It's nice to have one set of rules that then you can teleport across or be flexible and take it to different periods. But the exam question for today on the big issue is, do you lose something which is unique about one particular historical period for which you're writing a set of rules to cover that period? You know, for example, the same set of rules might not be suitable for First World War and the Second World War. To what extent... Is there an argument that you would create one set of rules to reflect one culture, another set of rules to reflect another culture, even where those cultures like, you know, Western Australia, Western America in the late 19th century, probably quite similar. But to what extent is there an argument that you should create perhaps two different set of rules or or fundamentally change some of the design dynamics which are in which are inherent in the rules when you look at different cultures, different locations and different historical periods, even though they're quite close together? Yeah, the, I mean, technically, the answer is yes, you, you should start at, start at the very beginning rather than just taking something and nailing a few bits on. But I think uh, my feeling with what a cowboy is, it, it's, 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 a, it's an arcade game type of setup. It's, it's good fun. And therefore, what you want to do is... Uh, reflect the weaponry, so changes in weaponry, but that's easily done within the existing mechanics. And and you then want to to add the colour in a in a manner that uh complements what is there beforehand. So for example, I like Nick has done with the underlay gang, I've rolled up my New South Wales police. I've got Inspector Ronald Bradman, who's from England he came out to farm, but he, he the farm failed, so he joined the police. He's a dead eye with a pistol. I've got Sergeant Michael Fitzroy, who's from Kilkenny in Ireland, formerly Royal Irish Constabulary, emigrated to Australia's sunny shore. He's quick draw with a pistol. So you've got to change the backgrounds for some of these people because they're, they're, they don't have so much of a Wild West background. You know, a Trooper Davis has been, was transported for petty larceny in the 1850s. You won't roll that up in What a Cowboy, but you, you can roll that up. So, for example, whilst it's still a bit of fun, I've got the breakdown here of the uh, New South Wales Police in 1872. And they're 22% English, they're 60% Irish, 6% Scottish, 10% Australian, and whatever the remainder is, 2% or whatever, 
Norwegians or, or some other random uh, nationality. Um, so what you, what you do is you just do a little bit of research and you, you're saying, well, the majority of my New South Wales troopers should be Irish of, or of Irish extraction. Um, so you, you, you can do a little bit of research and then the historical backgrounds become more plausible. And I think in a game like what Cowboy, we're not representing small unit tactics in the 1880s. It's it's an arcade game, first person shooter type, fun game, and so you're looking for a different type of uh, injection of history. I mean, I mean, Sid, really, the answer to your question is is before you on your desk. If you pick up uh, what a cowboy, and you pick up what a tanker. So what a tanker is the 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 you know the the ancestor, if you like, of what a cowboy. The mechanisms of what a cowboy, the water mechanism, comes from what a tanker. So, you know, that's that's the simple core of it is the skeleton that goes into what a cowboy. And then, of course, what what John's done is he's shaken the tree, shaken off all the bits that are kind of tank specific, uh, that, that are therefore not relevant for his cowboys and added in the bits for the cowboys. But, this is, but, it, but the main core of the skeletal dip is still the same. Yeah, so the, you got the answer. Well done. Good points for both of you, but I think you really hit the, the answer there. That that was the clue in the title, really, wasn't it? The, the what a cowboy and what a tanker. So I think it's really viable to be able to do that because I think where you've where you've really focused on a, on on having fun is really the essence of a game. What does the fun what does the fun deliver? Well, it really delivers what it says on the tin. You know, it's a really fast playing game of rest and conflict. And I think where you want to get that speed and that quickness and that intuition using an existing rule set is a really good way of doing that. So people who've enjoyed what a tanker can enjoy what a cowboy don't need to have done that to start with. But I think that transporting those engines across different periods and different times and very different games in some respects, it really can work and pay dividends. Pikachu. Yeah. That's the other yeah. thing you need. Pikachu for an Australian game. Right. Whatever. I think I definitely, I think your, your, your anesthetic hasn't yet worn off. <laughs> Um, but also, Sid, you know, who knows where it can go? You know, you know, I know John does what a um, gangster. You yeah. Know, which is, uh, you can you can just take these anywhere really. Once you've got that mechanism, and you're happy with it, or even you adapt it slightly, it moves on, doesn't it? That's how that's how game design kind of you know works. But equally, what he didn't just do is take the water engine and add it to Cowboys, you know, he, he, John's been playtesting it for three or four years. Yeah, no, I don't mean to, do, I, don't mean to I don't mean to make it sound like it's an easy thing to do. Because oh, no, I, no. I, and no, no re, I know his research by watching just about every Western that's ever been filmed as well. Yeah, so. yeah. <laughs> yeah but I mean, I, I he, he ran a great game at uh, Steel Lab, not last year, but the year before, which was what a drug cartel or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It was like some SWAT teams going into the Central American jungle to take out a uh, 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 drug cartel's headquarters. And it was a fabulous-looking game. I mean, it was a stunning-looking game. And it, it was really hilarious ending. The, the the drug lord was about to get on a light aircraft with a big bag of cash and escape, and the CIA operative took a shot at him, forced him to duck back, and he ducked back into the propeller of the light aircraft. <laughs> And was splattered across the jungle. It was really cinematic. I mean, you can you can imagine a film where that a James Bond film maybe with that happens. It was, <laughs> it was great, great to see. Good fun. Well, that's been a great discussion. I hope that's been useful to everyone relating to what we're doing and being excited by with What a Cowboy. But let's move swiftly along because I know just in the second half of May 2023. Uh, all of us are going to be at Partizan and we're going to be playing Arnhem and possibly other games which may be there as well. But certainly Chain of Command and the Arnhem setup will be there, I think, Nick. Yeah, that's the plan. I think all the tables will be there. I, I'm not quite sure exactly, but it'll be a nice surprise, won't it? You'll enjoy it, whatever it is, mate. Yeah. Come to Partizan. John's, John's yeah. there with what a cowboy. Yeah. And after that, I think we've then got on the 2nd of June. Um, we're all going to Operation Market Laden in Evesham. Yeah, we've got Market Laden coming up, and then that's followed by Deep Fried Lard up in Edinburgh. So there's a whole host, and then the summer explodes into a lard fest of right. this, that, and the other. So it's, yeah, a real summer. This is the summer of lard. Absolutely. And that will be something that I think all of us are taking part in. We're all going all over the place with lard 
this summer, which would be great. But I think rather than previewing that in detail now, that's probably that for another show. And that means that all we've really got to do is to sign off. And I thank you both, Richard and Nick, for being my guests on this oddcast. And um, we'll sign out with Roger Barraclough and the gang. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Sydney Roundwood was joined by Nick Skinner and Richard Clark. Music by Roger Barclough and his band.